Good afternoon. We're here with Andre Chow, the co-founder and CEO of Touch Surgery, a London-based app which allows surgeons to practice their procedures before actually going into the operating theatre. Exactly. So, Andre, how did the idea for Touch Surgery arise? Well, um, I'm a surgeon by training myself, and myself and my co-founder is also a training surgeon. Uh, kind of being in the trenches, we understood the challenges that were really affecting our profession. Um, so I guess this is something maybe that a lot of people don't know about, but um, our training hours are being cut, people are getting far less access to the operating room, um, and as a, as a result really, surgeons nowadays perhaps aren't getting the same level of training that they've done in years past. Um, you know, we could see that problem happening, um, we could see that healthcare wasn't really reacting to it. Um, there was a lot of talk around how surgical simulation could maybe impact this trend. Um, and actually my, my co-founder Jean had done a master's in surgical simulation, so it was pretty up to date on the topic. But you know, a lot of problems with those simulators are that the solutions just don't scale. You know, you have big flight simulator like machines that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know it just becomes inaccessible to the majority of or the majority of global surgery. So what we wanted to do really was to create a solution that allowed surgeons to train and rehearse um, any procedure, yeah. wherever they were, you know, whenever they wanted, um, and to use kind of modern technology to help us achieve that. Um, I think you know we were really lucky that we were at the right place, right time, because you know everyone's got smartphones, everyone's got tablets, so the hardware platform was kind of already there and already set. Everyone already had it. Um, and all we needed to do was to create the, the software package that could deliver that solution. So yeah, so I, I guess we started that about three, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, we both learned how to code ourselves. Um, started making our our product in you know in the bedroom in the garage on weekends and evenings, um, and it's just grown spectacularly since then. Wow. So how does the app actually replicate the procedures that surgeons are, mm -hmm. are carrying out? So. When we started this, we took a, a long look at kind of the elements of surgical skill, you know, what makes a really good surgeon. Now, everyone knows a, a surgeon needs good hands, that's obvious, but not many people think about the, the brain of a surgeon or the cognitive abilities of a surgeon. And if you look through kind of all the academic literature around surgical skill, you'll find that actually about 75% of a safe operation is down to a surgeon's brain rather than his hands. But at the same time, there's no real formalized method of teaching surgical decision making or surgical, surgical cognitive skills. Mm. So that's the bit that we look at. So we go and work with expert surgeons in their fields. Uh, we have in-depth interviews with them, we video them operating, and we really try and understand exactly everything that they are going through, all of their cognitive decisions that they make during the operation. Um, and then we convert that into, you know, through an algorithm that we use called cognitive task analysis, um, combine that with our virtual human patient, um, and allow you to replicate that decision-making process. Um, I guess in a way it's like, a, we, we often use the analogy of Formula One racing, right? So, you know, you've got Lewis Hamilton in his car, and, you know, yes, you need to know how to turn the wheel left and right yeah. and use your pedals, but, you know, the night before he's going for a race, He's practicing in his mind, you know, turn one is what, turn two is right, turn three is left, then left again, and then you have to slow down here. And it's that cognitive rehearsal and cognitive element to physical performance um, that I think we, we really target. It's fascinating. So, um, I mean, it's well documented that the doctors, or many doctors, still use fax machines as yes. the main way of, yes. of communicating. Yes. So, I suppose it begs the question how open to innovation and innovation through tech mm -hmm. are the community you're targeting? I think doctors are very open to it. The systems in which they work in okay. are less so, yeah. right? So I think healthcare is one of those sectors that has been very slow um, in the uptake of, of the latest tech. I think there are lots of good reasons for that. You know, healthcare is extremely heavily regulated. Um, there are lots of obstacles to, to overcome um, for, a, for a tech company to penetrate the market. And I think that, that scares a lot of people off, mm. to be honest. Um, you know, dealing with healthcare systems, hospital systems, they're all very slow-moving beasts. 
um, and usually, I guess, not the sort of environment that a, that a startup would thrive in. Who, you know, startups like to move quickly and be agile and so on, but that doesn't describe a typical healthcare system. Um, but you know, the the reaction that we've gotten from the search community has been outstanding. Um, I think I think everyone that we've talked to, that we've shown the product to, really understands what we're trying to achieve. You know, that we're really trying to disseminate best practice. Um, raise the standards of global surgery, improve patient care everywhere around the world. Everyone gets that. Um, and everyone sees that there is a need for a solution like ours. So on the whole, yeah, the support and the reaction has been incredible. Um, yeah. So how have you tried to gain access and have you gone through the institutions or have you gone direct to, to surgeons and none of that way? So obviously, you know, surgery is a, a small community. Uh, you know, we have our own contacts and people yeah. obviously that we reached out to at first to, to trial our product initially. Um, but I think the real growth, you know, that took off about a year and a half, a year and a half ago or so, is really from the grassroots up. You know, we've spent no money on marketing. We don't, you know, actively have ad campaigns or anything like that. Um, we just put the app on the app store and it spread through word of mouth because people found it useful and because they found that it made a difference to their practice. Um, now we're at a stage where, yes, we are talking on a more formal basis with different residency programs in the States, for example. Yeah. Uh, we're rolling out at places like um, Stanford, for example, next week um, in their residency program that we're very, very happy That's about. Cool. Um, we've recently been formally endorsed by the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Uh, which is a, a major step for us. Um, so, as well as getting kind of grassroots supports now, we're starting to get more and more actual support from the institutional level of, of healthcare, which is fantastic. And as well as this being a solution to surgeons, mm -hmm. I read that actually patients yes. that are using this for peace of mind and, and, and other related issues. To what extent is that? Is that the yes. Case? So that was a that was a, a surprising yeah. a surprising thing that happened. Um, so obviously when we created this platform, it was aimed more specifically towards healthcare professionals. But we started getting emails from patients saying, hey, you know, now, now I understand what I'm going to go under next yeah. week. Thank you very much. Makes sense. Um, you know, we've had doctors reach out to us who use our platform on a day-to-day -day basis, not for themselves, but actually so that they can educate their patients. Um, Patient education is an incredibly important part of healthcare that's sometimes overlooked. Um, the more informed the patient is about the care that they receive, the more likely they are to actually you know, recover faster, they understand what's going to be happening, they cooperate more with the healthcare facilities afterwards. So I think patient education is something that we're definitely going to be looking at more in the future. Um, I think the content that we create can easily be adapted for, for the patient uh, community. Um, and, and something that we're looking forward to doing. And, and so how transferable do you think these skills are? I mean, to use the analogy of, of taking penalty and mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. versus in a real life situation. Yeah. Is, is that comparable or, you, or is it really transferable in these skills? I think with every kind of tool that you use to, to improve surgical skill, you, you have to take it in context. You know, I'm not going to say that a surgeon can be completely trained on an iPad, right? That's not realistic at this point. But if you ask an established surgeon who you know, has, has trained and you ask him what stops him from adopting a new technique, right? Yeah. he'll never tell you it's because oh, my hands aren't good enough or I don't know how to cut or I don't know how to stitch. Right? It's always about cognitively, I don't really understand what the difference is between this procedure and the next one and it's that cognitive barrier that stops him. Right? What we do is to help surgeons overcome that cognitive barrier. Right. Technical skills are very transferable, um, and where we fit in is kind of getting people over that, that hurdle of understanding the procedure to the extent that they need to do um, in order to perform it. And just to, at a broader level, so you chose to base the company in London. Mm -hmm. I know from a government level there's a big push to position London as a leading hub yeah. for health and health tech. Yeah. How, how do you evaluate the, the ecosystem? Yeah. I think the ecosystem's growing. Um, I do think that we're still behind our, our friends over the pond. Um, you know, even in the last two years, I've seen, you know, that there's been a huge amount of growth in this area um, over here in London. 
you know, two years ago, it was hard to get any sort of meeting with kind of any investor or any group, um, you know, when we had our initial product. Nowadays, there are far more open doors. Um, there's a much bigger sense of a, a building community. I don't think it's established yet. Um, but, you know, even places like the Royal Society of Medicine are now having kind of like tech entrepreneurship workshops and so on that weren't happening two years ago. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a, like you say, there's, there's been a big push towards kind of improving um, that community over here. And I think we're starting to feel the effects of it, but I think there's a long way to go. And what is the access to capital like? I'm guessing that many of us have done done anything in health mm. until very recently. So. I think again, I think healthcare suffers because it's a scary word for a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of people, as soon as you, they hear that you're involved in healthcare in any way, they're like, oh, too risky. I don't understand it. We don't have expertise in that area. Yeah. And you know, healthcare is slow. And I, I get. I guess a lot of those things are true. Right. Um, I think more and more people are starting to realise that healthcare is the next kind of really big frontier um, to tackle. Mm. You know, I mean, fintech is booming. You know, you have apps like Uber that are transforming transportation. Healthcare, I think, is the next big one. Um, I think in the US, especially, people are starting to cotton on to that fact, um, and that's slowly starting to spread over here as well. And are you seeing that at a grassroots level as well in terms of talent? Are you able to compete with maybe the more consumer-facing businesses for, for grassroots talent? I think we're seeing more and more um, investors who are specifically interested in healthcare. Yeah. So whereas before, only people who had a background in healthcare would, would kind of be open to the idea, mm. we're getting more and more people now who do not have a healthcare background start to actually look at that sector. Um, and hopefully, you know, that will bring in more investments for more, more entrepreneurs. So finally, what other areas, apart from the one that you're operating in, do you think are particularly interesting within, within health and health tech? Um, I think, you know, we're really interested in things like medical robotics, right? Um, I won't tell you exactly how we plan to get there, but, you know, I think the, the, the world is facing a shortage of surgeons and doctors in general. Right. Um, I don't necessarily believe that the only way to fix that problem is just to train more people. Like you can do that, um, but there's a huge amount, I believe, in medicine that can be automated. A huge amount of efficiencies that can be gained by improving processes, um, using technology, and so on. Uh, I really think kind of those areas are, are something that's you know are things that are really interesting to us, um, and we hope to be able to take what we've learned from training surgeons and actually start applying it directly to patient care as well. Interesting. Good luck. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Cheers, Andre. No worries.